Good evening. Welcome. By now, you should know I'm Aaron Bastani. Welcome to Navarra Live. This evening, I'm joined by Econ Chad, James Medway. James, how are you? Very well, thank you. I'm just chuckling at that description. But anyway, good evening to you, Aaron. Well, I think it's kind of, uh, it's highlighted by your increasingly impressive sculpted facial hair, James. I haven't seen you very frequently in the last couple of years, but it's it's really coming on. On tonight's show, NATO leaders are meeting in Lithuania. We'll be discussing the latest from there. Some very interesting admissions made by a top water boss about the reality of privatization, and mortgage rates have hit a 15-year high. We'll look at the impact that's having. The BBC host scandal rumbles on with some twists and turns. Last night, the young person at the centre of the scandal asked their lawyer to release a statement. It said this, For the avoidance of doubt, nothing inappropriate or unlawful has taken place between our client and the BBC personality, and the allegations reported in the Sun newspaper are rubbish. Nobody from the Sun newspaper appears to have made any attempt to contact our client prior to the publication of the allegations on Friday 6th of July. The lawyer also said the young person told the son on Friday evening before the newspaper published the story that there was, quote, no truth to it. The son went ahead with the story anyway. In response, the son said this, We have reported a story about two very concerned parents who have made a complaint to the BBC about the behaviour of a presenter and the welfare of their child. Their complaint was not acted upon by the BBC. We have seen evidence that supports their concerns. It's now for the BBC to properly investigate. So was the son's story really about two concerned parents? Just as a reminder, here's what they published on Saturday. Top BBC star in Sex Picks Probe, presenter now off air. That doesn't seem to be about the parents. And here was Sunday's front page. BBC star sent pants pick to teen mum's shock at X-rated mobile imaging. Again, not really about the parents. Then there was this yesterday, the third consecutive front page, suspended BBC man's panic call to youngster. Today, the tabloid, and now we're talking about day number four, double down running this front page. Dad, BBC, a liar. Family of youth spent hour telling Beeb their fears in May. Here's the quote, we only spoke out to help save vulnerable addict child. In response to the controversy, BBC Director General Tim Davey said this on Radio 4's World at One. The corporate investigations team looked at the log that's a summary of the call. We have got clear records of an interaction that lasted through the call and the summary of that call and of 29 minutes. That summary then goes to the corporate investigations team passed by audience services and they assessed it, Sarah, exactly as you say. Okay, and in and that, that they, summary, they, in the information that was that the BBC became aware of at that stage, was it clear that, as the family have suggested, that the, there were contacts made and they dated back three years I'm not from going, when I, the child I, was I 20? I cannot get into specifics. What I would say is it was clearly serious allegations because they were serious because we gave them to the, or the corporate investigations team, decided to push forward and investigate the case. Okay. So this but is in, seems weird. But it's important, Sarah, just I've, if I may, it's very important that these, the team saw them as serious allegations. Okay, which, the, which the, seems the, so weird as to why the, it, the presenter was only spoken to on, the, on July well, let, the 6th. Let, let's talk about that for a minute, because I think that is a really important point, which is if you've got an allegation coming into a corporate uh, investigations team. And I think you need to balance the concerns of duty of care, privacy, all those things I've talked about. I don't think you take that complaint direct to a presenter. If you just work that through, if anything that comes through or any call that hasn't been verified just gets bought in front of someone, what I would say is it is important at that point. I think this is right to validate that, to have our not just the audience services team, but the specialists talk to that individual, understand their concerns and go through that process. I think that's essential before you take Okay, it but there were only two attempts made to contact the family, one by email, one by phone. Does that, does that seem fine to you? I think one of the things I've said today is I think that is a fair question. And as Director General, I want to make sure and look at a couple of things, actually. The first thing is immediately, do we raise the red flags quick enough on, on complaints of this nature? 
And the second is the processes and protocols. There may well be some learnings from this case. The police have now asked the BBC to stop their internal investigation. They released this statement. We've asked the BBC to pause its own investigation while we continue our assessment to establish whether there is evidence of a criminal offence being committed. The assessment is being led by detectives from the Met Specialist Crime Command and follows a virtual meeting with representatives from the BBC on the morning of Monday 10th of July. Given the statement from the young person, questions are now being asked about whether the son may have libelled the unnamed BBC presenter if their claims turn out to be false. However, some in the media don't seem to understand quite how libel law actually works. Ben Leo is the programme editor of GB News's Dan Wotton Tonight. He posted this on social media. You are aware someone has to be identified to be sued for libel. Now, to be clear, this is completely false. It's incorrect. If an audience can still work out who you're talking about, even if you haven't named them, you may still have libeled that individual or even another individual that the audience believes you intended to refer to. This could be implied through innuendo or the so-called jigsaw identification. That occurs when the defamed person isn't named by a publication, but is nonetheless identified using other information. And there's case law behind it too. In 2012, the BBC lost a defamation case brought by Alastair McAlpine, a former advisor to Margaret Thatcher and a Tory peer. The BBC had aired an episode of Newsnight that linked a, quote, senior conservative to the North Wales child abuse scandal. That then caused a scandal on Twitter, a Twitter storm, as they say. A 2012 Observer article reports this. A hum of online chatter grew to a buzz as individuals in the know vied with each other for 140 character remarks. Sally Burko, wife of the common speaker, John Burko, tweeted, quote, Why is Lord McAlpine trending? Innocent face. George Monbiot, the green activist who writes a column for The Guardian, wrote, I looked up Lord hashtag McAlpine on to internet. It says the strangest things. The 70-year-old McAlpine was then driven from his home after coming under siege from journalists, photographed packing up and leaving with his suitcase. Now, that story turned out to be false. And despite not being named, McAlpine won £185,000 plus costs from the BBC and a further £125,000 plus costs from ITV. McAlpine also pursued Twitter users who he said had defamed him. George Monbiot and Sally Burko later reached settlements with him. In the BBC case, The Sun has so far only presented allegations from family members. But... In the process, they've kicked off a social media storm with thousands of online users trying to identify the suspended presenter. That's led to a number of high-profile BBC hosts denying any connection to the story, which is itself information that makes the man increasingly likely to be identified. And now, some MPs are threatening to reveal him under the cover of parliamentary privilege. Work and Pensions Secretary Mel Stride appeared on Sky News where he was asked about that possibility. I can only speak for myself. It's a very personal thing. I would personally certainly not be doing that. Now, members of Parliament do have a right to privilege and uh, to be able to say things to the Commons without fear of legal repercussions. But I think that is a privilege that should be used very sparingly and so with great thought. So... I can only speak for myself and say that that is certainly something that I would not choose to do. I would want to see process uh, continue here as quickly as possible, and that is what the Secretary of State for Media and uh, Culture uh, has been doing, has been pressing the BBC to do that. Um, I'm as confident as I can be that they will be now moving at pace. And I think we have to see where all of this lands and then start to make these judgments about whether things were done the right way or not, or whether people should be named or not, and so on and so forth. Interestingly, former Sun editor Kelvin McKenzie posted this on social media. Unless an MP reveals the name under the protection of Parliament, I don't believe the identity of the BBC employee will ever be revealed. Instead, early retirement will be offered. What mustn't happen is any form of severance package. The star brought this on themselves. Weird. If the Sun stands by their story and has the receipts, why aren't they revealing the BBC host? Earlier today, Prime Minister Rishi Sunak weighed in on the story. He said this, 
What was your reaction when you heard about the allegations against a certain BBC presenter? Well, obviously, they're very serious and concerning allegations. And that's why I'm pleased that the Culture Secretary spoke to the Director General of the BBC over the weekend and is confident that the BBC is investigating this both rigorously and rapidly. I think that's the right course of action. What would you say to people on social media? Indeed, some MPs who say they might use parliamentary privilege to try and name this presenter. Look, look, we have an existing set of laws that govern free speech and privacy. I think it's important that the BBC conducts this investigation quickly and rigorously, given the concerning and serious nature of the allegations. In a further development to this story, a new young person has come forward with allegations against the same presenter, though of a very different kind. The BBC reports this. The individual in their early 20s was first contacted anon anonymously by the male presenter on a dating app. They say they were put under pressure to meet up, but never did. When the young person hinted online they might name the presenter, they were sent abusive, expletive-filled messages. Speaking to BBC News, the young person, who has no connection to the person at the centre of the Sun's story about payments for photos, said they had been scared by the power the presenter held. They said the threats made in the messages, which have been seen and verified by BBC News, had frightened them and they remained scared. James, what do you make of this? I know some people think this is a, a fatuous story, it's gossip, but I think there's so many elements to this which are of, of real public interest and importance. And first and foremost, for me, is the relationship of the son to the story itself. They don't seem to have reported this in a way which is commensurate really with journalistic ethics. And now we have people like Kelvin McKenzie saying, well, if somebody doesn't name him in parliament, the, the, the alleged transgressor here, then we'll never know the person who's actually the center of this story. What do you make of this? It's already strange given his own former paper broke this. It's, it's quite peculiar all round and, and there's, there's lots and lots of different sort of elements in play here, one of which seems to be, and I was away over the weekend and, and picked up slightly later on, on, on the story, but one of them seems to be the original reporting appeared to rely on essentially a single source, which is the, the young person's uh, mother. Uh, and then later, this sort of developed uh, from that point over successive days, which seems a bit odd, particularly in light of then getting this statement from the lawyer with the, the claims made by, by the young person involved here. So it seems very peculiar that way for the sun to proceed in sort of basic journalistic standards, you know, what you might anticipate as you put a story to someone and you get another source for it and, and these sort of things come in. And instead, this has now rumbled on for some period of time with actually uh, some increasing uncertainty uh, uh, around some, some key elements of it and, and various counterclaims backwards and forwards going on there. Stepping back a bit, there's also that sort of inevitability around these sorts of things that it's just folded rapidly into a culture wars issue, which then doesn't entirely help anyone, quite deliberately so in the case of certain Tory MPs popping up and saying, oh, well, this is a good reason to take the BBC's licence fee away again, this sort of thing, that immediately, politicisation, what, what at the centre could actually be incredibly serious and, and, and terrible thing, politicised into the culture wars and politicised to the point of saying it's yet again, uh, it's the BBC and, and, and the various sort of the usual kind of Tory right versions of why the BBC is bad and why it must have its licence fee taken away and all the rest of it. So there's a great deal of noise around all of this and a deal of uncertainty about what's actually going on in the middle of it. James, I'm so happy you said that because I think lots of people following the story would say, well, you're, you're left-wing media, you're different to all the other media, why are you covering this? I think it's quite obvious that this story is being used as really a battering ram against the BBC and its credibility by organisations with, with a vested interest in the BBC failing. Um, that includes outlets owned by Rupert Murdoch. I think arguably it includes GB News, the way they've covered it. I think the, the way they cover the BBC generally, and, and that's, not, that's not to get personal, this is business. There's a massive broadcast market in this country, and right now when it comes to broadcast news, the BBC takes up a massive share of it. And importantly, because the way that the BBC is funded with licence fee uh, payer money, all of us paying into it, everybody has an interest in BBC-related stories. Today, the BBC released its annual report of the kind of pay it gives its top performers, its top stars. And there were some really interesting things there. You know, you can look at this on the BBC website. Gary Lineker still earning the same as last year. Actually, broadly speaking, every pay has stayed the same, but he's on, you know, almost one and a half million. But then you read others, Stephen Nolan on more than £400,000. Um, Lauren Laverne on almost £400,000. Sophie Rayworth on £370,000. 
uh, George Allagaya on £340,000. Does anybody seriously think that George Allagaya is somehow irreplaceable? It seems to me that these individuals are being paid that amount of money purely because they're familiar to the British public. And of course, they're familiar because the BBC has this huge market share. All very strange. And of course, that is, that is just manna from heaven for the likes of The Sun and GB News because they have the BBC in their crosshairs. A NATO summit kicked off today in Vilnius, Lithuania. But divisions have emerged amongst the 31 member states over the question of fast-tracking membership for Ukraine. Nations with a recent history of enduring Russian aggression, like Poland and Estonia, want NATO to issue an invitation for Ukraine to join the alliance. But the United States and Germany have set themselves against NATO membership at the moment. This is Joe Biden explaining why. When you go to uh, the NATO summit, the big strategic issue is that Ukraine wants membership in NATO. Um, should it get membership in NATO? I don't think it's ready for membership in NATO, but here's the deal. I spent, as you know, a great deal of time trying to hold NATO together because I believe Putin has had an overwhelming objective from the time he launched 185,000 troops into Ukraine. And that was to break NATO. He was confident, in my view, and many of the intelligence community, he was confident he could break NATO. So holding NATO together is really critical. I don't think there is unanimity in NATO about whether or not to bring Ukraine into the NATO family now, at this moment, in the middle of a war. For example, if you did that, then, you know, we, I, and I mean what I say, we're, we're determined to commit every inch of territory that is NATO territory. It's a commitment that we've all made no matter what. If the war is going on, then we're all in the war. You know, we're in war with Russia, if that were the case. So I think we have to lay out a path for the rational path for Russia, for, excuse me, for Ukraine to be able to qualify to get into NATO. And we have, when the very first time I met with Putin two years ago in Geneva, and he said, I want commitments on no Ukraine in, in, uh, in NATO. I said, we're not going to do that because it's an open door policy. We're not going to shut anybody out. NATO is a process that takes some time to meet all the qualifications and from democratization to a whole range of other issues. So in the meantime, though, I've spoken with Zelensky at length about this. And uh, one of the things I indicated is the United States would be ready to provide while the process was going on, and it's going to take a while, while that process was going on, to provide security a la the security we provide for, you, for Israel, providing the weaponry, the need, the capacity to defend themselves if there is an agreement, if there is a ceasefire, if there is a peace agreement. The Israel-style security agreement is being backed by the UK and France, and it would potentially see Ukraine supplied with further weapons, military training, intelligence sharing, and a partial seat at the NATO table. But what it won't include is an Article 5 commitment. That's the part of the NATO treaty that compels other NATO members to commit their troops and weapons to defending any member that comes under attack, including potentially using the nuclear arsenals of the US, France, and the UK. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky is not happy with the NATO light proposal. Hours before the members met, he said this. On the way to Vilnius, we received signals that certain wording is being discussed about Ukraine. And I would like to emphasize that this wording is about the invitation to become a NATO member, not about Ukraine's membership. It's unprecedented and absurd when time frame is not set neither for the invitation nor for Ukraine's membership. While at the same time, vague wording about, quote, conditions is adding even for inviting Ukraine. It seems there is no readiness neither to invite Ukraine to NATO nor to make it a member of the alliance. This means that a window of opportunity is being left to bargain Ukraine's membership in NATO in negotiations with Russia. And for Russia, this means motivation to continue its terror. So what's behind the NATO split? On the one hand, the Eastern European and Baltic nations think that an invitation to join NATO could have a chilling effect on Russia's aggression in Ukraine whereas the Israel plan creates uncertainty over the country's status, uncertainty that Russia could exploit. But there's also an economic implication to the Israel plan. It's expensive, potentially tying up billions during difficult economic times. One senior European official told the Financial Times this. 
The concern is that the more we talk about security guarantees or assurances or commitments, the more it becomes obvious that this is really expensive. The choice for NATO members is either the Israel model, which is them, Ukraine, being able to defend themselves, which is expensive in terms of investment, or the NATO model of us defending them if they need it, which is expensive in terms of the responsibility we take on. The issue of weapons provision is also one that many NATO members might not want to commit to after the US agreed to provide cluster bombs to Ukraine. Cluster bombs are devastating weapons. A larger bomb is dropped, breaking apart mid-flight and scattering a large number of smaller bomblets over a wide area. They're highly destructive weapons on the battlefield, killing and maiming indiscriminately. But their lethal power isn't limited to war. According to the International Red Cross, anywhere between 10 and 40% of bomblets don't explode on impact. Instead, they effectively mine vast areas of land, exploding later when discovered by civilians, who are very often children. In 2021, the latest year that we have data for, the Land Mine and Cluster Munitions Monitor said that of 141 casualties from cluster bomb remnants, 97% were civilians and two-thirds of those were children. NATO used cluster bombs and airstrikes on Serbia in the 1990s, killing hundreds of civilians. Western militaries also dropped hundreds of cluster bombs in Iraq, causing more casualties than any other weapon. During the Vietnam War, the US dropped more than an astonishing 270 million cluster bombs on Laos, leaving a destructive legacy that continues to this day. In 2006, Israel dropped 2 million bomblets to devastating effect in southern Lebanon. In 2015, unexploded bomblets were still being cleared from civilian areas. Between 2012 and 2014, Bashar al-Assad used them against civilians during the Syrian civil war in densely populated urban areas. In 2008, over 100 countries signed a convention against the use and manufacture of cluster bombs. Signatories include the UK, France, Germany, and many other NATO members. But the US, Russia, and Ukraine didn't join that agreement. This is Joe Biden again, justifying the sale of such weapons to Ukraine. The Ukrainians are running out of ammunition. Uh, the ammunition that they, they call them 155 millimeter weapons. This is a this is a war relating to munitions, and uh, the running out of those that ammunition, and we're low on it. And so, what I finally did took the recommendation of the Defense Department to not permanently, but to allow for in this transition period where we get more 155 weapons, these shells for the Ukrainians to provide them with a something that has a very low dud rate. It's about one, I think it's 150, which is the least likely to be blowing. And it's not used in civilian areas. They're trying to get through those trenches and those then stop those tanks from rolling. And so, uh, but it was not an easy decision. And it's not, we're not signatories to that, that agreement, but I, um, it took me a while to be convinced to do it. But the main thing is they either have the weapons to stop the Russians now from their, keep them from stopping the Ukrainian offensive through these areas, or uh, they don't. That is such an extraordinary admission. Russian production of armaments have been surprisingly constant. It's now operating something of a war economy in certain areas, with arms factories open 24 hours a day. Non-stop production of armaments. Meanwhile, NATO members have not really moved their own weapons production to a higher level. That's why you often hear about the UK or France or Germany sending weapons that they don't really have an abundance of. So there's a shortfall, and Ukraine could run out of key weapons. And that is part of the reason why the country is now getting these highly controversial cluster bombs. It's important to say we know that Russia has been using cluster bombs against Ukraine. Like the US, Russia is not a signatory to the prohibition of such weapons. But it is remarkable that because Ukraine doesn't have the weapons that it needs, it's now being viewed as permissible and legitimate to use technology that fundamentally harms, hurts, and maims civilians for decades after their deployment. Many NATO members have been made uncomfortable by the US's provision of these weapons to Zelensky. And personally, I can see why. Last month, Britain's largest privately owned water company, Thames Water, announced that bills would have to increase by 50% next year. At the same time, then CEO Sarah Bentley announced her departure, and she was replaced by Catherine Ross. 
Today, Mrs. Ross was grilled by members of the London Assembly regarding the city's water supply and London's ability to meet the demand for water over the coming decades. The answers from Ross were surprisingly honest and a tacit admission regarding the failures of privatisation. Here's Labour's Leonie Cooper asking whether bills are going to go up. One of the issues, apart from the logistical challenge of your 20,000 kilometres of pipes and digging up all of London streets and dealing with all of the leakage, is the financial cost. And obviously that's been absolutely front and centre of the coverage recently, um, talking about whether or not Thames Water has, no longer has financial stability. It's servicing a £14 billion debt. I've heard you to saying we've got £4.4 billion of liquidity. Um, but, you know, clearly there is an issue here about, you know, you're talking about a lengthy programme. So £750 million more from your shareholders is one thing, but that isn't going to cover just what we're talking about in London alone, let alone the rest of your, the whole of your catchment, if you like. So, you know, are you thinking of raising funds from customers? Where will the rest of the money come from? Yeah, I, I think that is probably the most critical question that we've got to answer. I mean, you know, so we, we, we've been talking just now about leakage. Leakage is one of the problems we've got to solve. And I've talked a little bit about how we might do that. It's not the only problem. I mean, we've got to solve the problem of, of sewage discharge into rivers. We've got to do we more. We will on come on to sewage going into I, rivers. I'm, sure you, I'm, I'm sure not going will. to ask about that, but my colleagues definitely no, will be. No, I'm sure. But, but you know, all of these things need considerable new investment. Mm. And, and those investment drivers are, are twofold. One, one is that we do have an ageing asset base. Uh, we've not been replacing our assets in the way that, that might have been expected. Uh, to be fair, customers haven't been paying for us to replace our assets in the way that we might have expected, uh, but the fact remains we haven't been. I love this English understatement. We haven't replaced our assets like might have been expected. Translation, private water companies have paid more than £70 billion in dividends since the late 1980s and taken on £60 billion of loan debt, but they didn't spend very much on actually maintaining and building water infrastructure. Hmm. And the idea that, as Mrs Ross says, customers haven't been paying for that either, well, she couldn't be more wrong. Water bills have risen 50% faster than inflation since the late 1980s. In other words, the costs of water bills have outstripped price rises across much of the rest of the economy. A rather sheepish Mrs. Ross proceeded to infer that despite water companies being privately owned, they might need some state funding. We've got additional investment that's needed to cope with things like climate change adaptation, climate change mitigation uh, and population growth on top of that. Um, and th those are all things that customers haven't paid for in the past. Uh, and I'm afraid it, it is an unpopular uh, fact, but it is a fact that there is only one source of funding. Um, and the source of funding is, is ultimately the customer, uh, at least in the absence of taxpayer funding, and the customer and the taxpayer aren't very different. Um, so one of the things we, we really do need to think about, well, we need to think about a few things. One is it's absolutely incumbent on us to deliver the infrastructure investment that's needed in the way that is most efficient. We, we can't ask customers to pay one pound more than they really need to pay to solve the problem. That, that's, that's just a hygiene factor. We have to do that. Then I think, and again, this isn't always very popular, but we have to be able to spread those big lumpy investment costs over a long period. And that means we do need finance to do that. We need investors to give us the money today that we can spend today, but we need to be able to recover it over a long period. And that, that's very, very important. And then thirdly, we need to plan over the long term and deliver over the long term so that we can find innovative solutions working with, with others. So, so things like, and we will come on later and talk about surface water drainage, I'm, I'm sure, but there's more that we can do in partnership there where some of the funding can come from water companies and their customers. But also we may be able to do more working with local authorities, we may be able to do more working with community groups, we may be able to do more working with local businesses, for example. So we have to do all of those things if we're going to address the problem. Innovative solutions, partnership, we'll be looking at partnerships. Doesn't it all sound so progressive and cooperative, so modern? We'll be working together as partners. Partners with who? Local authorities. Now, pay attention here. What is being said is that to deal with climate change, private water companies might work alongside the state in order to deliver new infrastructure. But I thought these were private businesses. Or is it simply they're private businesses when it comes to dividends and executive pay, but they want partnership funded by taxpayer DOSH when they actually have to build stuff? 
And the point about population growth being a problem, well, that's partly true, but Mrs. Ross, that also means there'll be more people paying to buy water. These people really think we're dopes, don't they? James, what did you make of this? It was one of those interesting conversations where everything's very understated, nothing seems particularly yeah. dramatic, but actually the content is really radical. Yeah, sort of inadvertently, uh, although it's of a piece with discussions you might have seen, you know, a sort of week or so ago, leaks uh, from one of the other water companies, I think it was Seven uh, Water, uh, aiming to set up a round table with Will Hutton uh, with a view to influencing the next Labour government, assuming Labour actually win the next election, who have pretty much ruled out renationalisation of water, but we can come back to whether that's sustainable. Uh, and instead, we'll be looking at some model of partnership and this nice sort of fluffy sort of cooperative language which some of which you saw uh, in use there. The key to this is something else uh, the Thames Water boss said, which was uh, that point about climate change mitigation and adaptation, that it's just going to get increasingly costly to deal with the effects of climate change. That You can sort of see this already. You have droughts, you have floods. It's actually costly to have to deal with this and still keep a water system running. There is increasing pressure on water supplies across the world because of climate change. You either have too much water where you don't want it or not enough water where you do. That's basically how the thing plays out. It's expensive to deal with that. Privatised water companies don't want those costs. So what they want to do is do something the economists call de-risk it, which means put as many as those costs somewhere else, like on the state, on a local authority, on whoever it might be, some arm of government, whilst they carry on keeping the profits out the other side. And that's the ideal solution for them. It's nonsense. It's the kind of thing we saw with the banks in 2008, where you socialize the losses. We all carry the losses, but you keep the profits nicely private. Thank you very much for the shareholders. It's exactly the same kind of model that they're trying to uh, use here under the cover of partnership, under the cover of cooperation, under the cover of all these sort of nice, fluffy sounding things. Again, it was very deft. It was very subtle. You know, we'll work with a range of partners like you know, community interest groups and local authorities. Uh, am I being a bit overly cynical here? Because local authorities isn't you know, saying in big, bold letters, the state, the taxpayer. But that's what it means, isn't it? Yes. I mean, who else can carry the kind of costs that you're looking at, the, the 50 billion or more that you need to get up to speed on water investment uh, in Britain over the next few years to, to pay for the effects of climate change, in effect? Um, th there isn't somebody else able to do that. And your shareholders aren't going to want to do it because this is just a big expense with essentially not very much in the way of return, right? You're having to pay to compensate for the costs of climate change. That's all it is. It's just a big drag. So of course you want the government to do it. And if you say, oh, it's a community interest group or it's local authority or whatever, it sounds a bit fluffier. And you can talk about partnership, but that word partnership means that one part of the partnership, the government, is going to carry all the costs and the other part of it is going to do uh, take all the profits. And, and they'll, they'll have the cover of its innovation and another sort of blast around it. I'm, I'm quite sure of that. But that's how the setup works. They want the privatised model to stay in place. They want to keep running as far as possible private water companies as basically cash cows for their shareholders. That's the model that we have here. You know, it's not quite been something very close to a licence to print money for a good long period of time. That's now changing fundamentally because of climate change. So they're looking for the government to step in and take on some of the costs. And they can keep the money printing machine going for their shareholders for as long as possible, as long as government is there saying, OK, we pay for the really expensive stuff. And when I say government, it kind of means all of us. I'm kind of shocked that we've still got this establishment grift going on, James, because you said, you know, those nice words, partnership, innovative solutions... Um, and what we have is the same thing that we've had really for, for, for 20 years, which is people with expensive haircuts, expensive kitchens that live in central London, nice suits, nice ties, and they're saying modern, innovative, efficient. And what they mean is outsourcing, shareholder profits, scam the taxpayer. You know, you uh, you previously worked for John McDonnell. You've, you've been really assessing these things for a very long time. Does it surprise you that this is still the kind of rhetoric that we hear from privately owned utilities like water companies, that they've not really changed their tune? It's not really profitable for them to, to change their tune fundamentally on this. They have a business model, which they quite like. Uh, if you're a shareholder of Thames Water, uh, this has been fantastic, really, for a very long period of time. Um, so that's great for them. It's not so good for everybody else. The, the cost increases, the inadequacies, as referenced, by the way, in that clip 
uh, by the Thames Water boss. That's the problems that we all have to deal with on the other side with this lumbering, awful business of climate change, which is going to impose huge costs and difficulties, even in you know rainy Britain, on how we deal with and manage water supplies so that everyone can actually have access to an essential of life. I mean, that's the, the fundamentals of the issue here. That's going to be really expensive. And the language they've got is all this nice fluffy stuff. And of course, if it does the job, they'll carry on using it. I do think there's a bit of a twist starting to happen around the world with how capitalism does adapt to climate change. You are starting to see more and more of governments moving into areas that in those years of neoliberalism, it was always sacrosanct. It was always like, let the market deal with this. That's what that's how we're going to run the economy. You now find things like over in the US, the Inflation Reduction Act, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars invested in clean energy technology. Similar thing with semiconductors. China's been doing this for years. The European Union is talking about this. This being Britain, we're, we're going to get a sort of half-cocked, dopey version of it, where it's mostly protecting private profits and not doing enough to actually look after people and provide a service. You can see how this is happening, because we have pretty inept institutions uh, for running the economy, and we don't have a political force at present that's going to change that. So we're going to end up with a, a bodge job version of this process. And you can see the water companies trying to line themselves up to keep their business model fundamentally intact preserve themselves against the threat of public ownership, which is real, because we may well find, as was threatened with Thames Water, that the government just has to step in because the thing's just fallen apart due to the rising costs and all the rest of it, that they want to hold off the threat of privatisation, keep their business model in place as far as possible, and they'll probably find some willing bits of state, like the Treasury, they love this sort of thing, to make that happen. And that, I think, is where we're going to end up with this one. Yeah, I think you've just put that so clearly there, James. And important to say that uh, Mrs Ross was previously at Offwatt. She was working for the regulator and now she's she's come in at Thames Water. She, she's being lined up to do precisely what you're saying, which is you know, steady the ship and ready it for this onslaught fundamentally. Now, Mrs. Ross's appearance today came after some good news for Thames Water Management because the company recently secured an extra £750 million investment from shareholders to help stave off nationalisation. That comes on top of the £500 million that investors pumped into Britain's biggest water company in March. Thames said the funding was contingent on a new business plan. Alistair Cochrane, the company's interim co-chief executive and formerly its chief financial officer, said it is, quote, entirely reasonable for them, the shareholders, to want to see that plan before committing. Again, allow me to translate. Shareholders invest money to make profit. That's literally the point. They're investing more money because a new business plan includes the expectation your bills will rise significantly next year. So, to stop water being renationalized and to make more money, you need to give us more cash so we can put up bills for the little guy. But if investors get a return, then where is the money coming from to actually build new infrastructure? Simple answer it's not happening. This is an exercise to keep the privatization show on the road for as long as possible. The gravy train will ignore all the red lights until it absolutely has to stop. And nobody in the permanent political class or the media has an interest in being honest about it. Quick break now before we move on to our next story. Stay tuned though, because if you're frustrated with landlords, we'll be discussing them also. Welcome to Navarra Media's The Dustbin of History Debates. People don't have pensions, so we make people who don't have enough money to buy a property pay someone else's pension. <laughs> For my rent increase, you bastard! If I was going to define toxic masculinity, I would say choosing a Navarra masculinity panel over Carly Rae Jepsen. What is going on? Pathologizing masculinity too much creates the problems around it and the expectations around it. The most difficult thing of all is to take a concept that has been in some ways warped and rebuild it into something better. The crops built into the DNA is violence, anti-workers' rights, um, is racism. Policemen in the dustbin of history! We have created a global, real-time computational network. Our planet has an exoskeleton of thinking machines, satellites. What is it all for? It's to sell ad revenues and to make you distracted. The point of the media is to get to the facts. It's to get to the truth. That's the point. If you want me to start critiquing the British press, I'm happy to. Do it. Our press corps is a joke. Why are left-wing politicians held to a completely different standard? The story in the media is already written. There is no meritocracy in media. And to be honest, in my opinion, I look at economic analysis in the media, 
That is not analysis. That is an entertainment product. You know, we've got this huge media machine which works against any kind of politics of hope. They are still quite concerned, I think, about the spectre of a socialist left which may have access to the public at large. Very many millions of people want a society in which people can live in dignity, the climate is protected, and there's very little political voice for that. Our entire like political and media establishment is glued together by like whatever torturous shit these people have done to each other in like Oxbridge. They don't like Navarra media. We're still there and there's still the embryo of a successful left populist project. If you are not taking these guys and rewarding them for being right and punishing them for being wrong, then they are not analyzing their fucking dancing. I'm enjoying our new breaks. It's good. We're almost a proper TV channel. And if you want to make us even more of a proper TV channel, and support truthful, honest media, then head to navaramedia.com slash support and help us be build a new media for a different politics. Link is in the description for that. To all our supporters out there, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. We have more than 300,000 uh, subscribers here on YouTube. I think 340,000 now. I say partly, overwhelmingly thanks to the genius of our video team, including Mr. James Fox right here with us. Uh, and I think we can make a real dent in discourse in this country over the next several years. Help us get there. Help us support people-powered media. Go to navaramedia.com forward slash support. Around 18 months ago, the base rate of interest was 0.5%. That's the interest rate at which the Bank of England lends money to private banks. A low base rate from the BOE means low interest rates are offered by banks to the consumer. So when the base rate goes up, Banks' interest rates on mortgage products, loans, and apparently savings do too, at least in theory. The base rate is now at 5%, and it's widely understood this could rise to as high as 7% by early next year. So, as a result, mortgage rates have now reached a 15-year high. Yep, they're now even higher than after the quasi quarting mini-budget during the short-lived premiership of Liz Truss. The Times writes this. The average two-year fixed mortgage rose to 6.66% today, exceeding the 6.65% they hit on October 20th, according to MoneyFax, a financial data analyst. Mortgage rates have risen rapidly since mid-May, and over the past two months, average monthly repayments have risen by £167 a month, or £2,004 a year, on a typical £200,000 25-year loan. That is huge. That is huge. On the average two-year fixed deal, that's the kind of mortgage most people get, you'll be paying an extra £2,000 a year than you would have just a few months ago. And by the way, rents back then were still very high compared to recent history. Around 2 million homeowners have come off fixed rate deals since the Bank of England started raising rates in December 2021. And by the end of 2024, that figure will have risen to 4.4 million. Every week, around 35,000 households are having to find a new mortgage deal, with many having to pay hundreds and sometimes thousands more than before. For some, maybe most, this will now be a more radicalizing experience than any manifesto or protest. Dare I say, more than any Navarra media video. Uh, going back to the Times, one expert they spoke to said people shouldn't worry too much though, and that better news was around the corner. I do anticipate we will see several more mortgage rate rises from the lenders in the short term, with the possibility that rates peak at around 7%. To me, it's a picture of rates topping out, a small decline by the end of the year, and then 2024 will be the year in which we hope rates will come down, but it won't be at any great speed. That was from a Mr. Simon Gammon. So according to Mr. Gammon, we could be over the worst of it by the end of this year. Personally, I wouldn't bet my house on that, which is what some people are literally doing. James, you're the economist. What's your view here? They're saying that mortgage rates are going to be averaging 7% by the end of this year. Elsewhere, if you look at things like interest rate swaps, the base rate is possibly headed to 7% by January next year, which would mean mortgage rates are a bit higher than that. Is Mr. Gammon being overly optimistic? 
A theory might be, actually. I mean, look, the most likely thing, the next set of inflation figures is out um, next week. It's likely, although we all said this last you know, last month, it's likely to show uh, something of a decline in the rate of inflation, which doesn't mean prices are falling on average. It means prices are still going up. They're not going up quite as much uh, as they used to be. That's probably what that's going to show. But the real perversity here, of course, is the, the data on wage rises, uh, which are still, by the way, below the rate of inflation. So everyone on average is being made poorer, but they were higher than expected. The new figures out today. So most likely the Bank of England is still going to look at those wage rises and say that means we have to jam up interest rates because the fundamental model here is that you put up interest rates to drive up unemployment and so clamp down on wage rises because everyone's too scared to ask for a raise. I mean, that's that's the, the model uh, as helpfully described by a, a Treasury advisor a few weeks ago. That's how the thing is supposed to work. Now, if inflation doesn't come down quite rapidly, the Bank of England because it's sort of committed to doing this. It has to be. This is its purpose in life as of the last 20 years or so of being independent from government and managing inflation. It has to sit there jamming up interest rates. It's the only thing it can really think to do at this point. So it's more and more misery a long way into the future. What happens over the end of this year and into next, I think it gets more uncertain. And this is, I think, where we get back into a kind of climate change story, where it's all those droughts across Europe now, 60% of Spain in drought, affecting harvests, affecting transportation, affecting whether French nuclear power plants can churn out as much electricity as they normally do, the sheer cost of heat waves, extreme heat, all this turns into more inflation. So I think we're going to be looking at a world in the future with just higher inflation in general, and therefore higher interest rates in general. And that's going to be pretty miserable for that set of people who have mortgages that they haven't paid off yet. One person who is really panicking is property tycoon Samuel Leeds. Here's Mr. Leeds last year when the going was a little bit easier in the property game. I work in London, I live in Buckinghamshire, but I invest up north. Right now we're in Huddersfield, this is Huddersfield. You buy a house here for like £80,000, you're going to rent it for £600. In London, you'll buy a house for £800,000, you're not going to rent it for 10 times the price. So you want to buy low, rent high with a property manager nearby. People say, oh, but Samuel, I have to buy close to where I live so that I can keep an eye on it if there's any problems. That's not financial freedom. That's called a rope around your neck. You want to buy properties in cheap areas, you want to rent them high, and you want to have systems in place and property managers that can make it passive income so that you can have financial freedom. That's called property investing the smart way. And here's Mr. Leeds explicitly talking about the kinds of system he means. If you've got 50 grand, buy a house, but buy a house that is run down, buy the worst house in the best street. So instead of buying a house for 200 grand that's in perfect, pristine condition and renting it out, find a house in the same street that's really run down that needs 50 grand spending on it. It's got structural problems, it's a mess, but buy it for 100 grand. Buy it cash. If you haven't got cash, you can get a bridging loan. It doesn't need to be your cash. Buy it for 100 grand, then spend 50 grand at doing it up. Doesn't have to be your money, you can get a bridging loan. I've got my own bridging company. Because a lot of people say, oh, how do you get bridging now? So I set my own company up. There you go, I can give you bridging, right? Yeah, it makes sense. If you've got the demand there, right. yeah, yeah. why not service mm, right. it? Right, yeah. so now you bought a house for 100 grand, you spent 50 grand on it, but now it's worth 200 grand because you've added value. So now what you do is you now refinance it, Bang. get a 75% mortgage loan to value, and they'll give you 75% of the new value. So instead of getting a mortgage before you buy, get a mortgage after you buy. So they'll give you 150 grand, which pays back your, you get your 50 grand back and you can pay the bridging company back and then you go again. And so you it's keep... recycling money. Correct, yeah. correct. Yeah, that makes and that, sense. And uh, that is how most wealthy people do do property. What is going up with his accent, by the way? He sounds like James Corden. I mean, it sounds like he's got some weird mid-Atlantic twang because he's trying to appeal to US audience as well. That's our theory here anyway at Navarra Media. What goes up invariably comes down, however, I'm sure your parents told you that as a kid, and guess what? They were right. Rising rates have left our TikTok property oracle in a sticky situation. The Bank of England are absolutely destroying and killing the property market right now. The housing market is on its knees. Property investment is very tough right now. And if you're anything like me and you've got a lot of houses, there's some of my properties that were making me nice money. I was making a couple hundred pounds a month. Now I'm losing money on. And it's the Bank of England's fault. So base rate going up has screwed us all. The money loaned out from the big banks like the Bank of England to the smaller banks um, 
the interest that it's gone up. It was 0.1%. Base rate keeps going up and up and up. It's now 4%. What that means is that means that when you're getting money, like a normal loan, a mortgage from, say, Lloyd's Bank, from Halifax, you're borrowing money that's borrowed. So they borrowed it to lend it you. Now, they were borrowing it at 0.1%. Now they're borrowing it at 4%. So how much are they going to charge you? 5%, 6%, 7%. We had properties, didn't we, Amanda? How much? We were paying like, what, three, four hundred pounds a month now yeah. we're paying? 600. 600. 600. And what's the rent? 500. 500. Right. So we were paying 300 on the, on the interest because base rate was low, interest, interest rates were low. Now we're paying 600. The rent's only 500. What does that mean? That means that the property sucks now. Now it's not an asset. It's a liability. Sorry, it's gone a little bit dark now. It's doom and gloom message. I think that's why. So what's happening now is people can't afford to buy houses. And the reason they can't afford to buy houses is because the interest rate is going to be so high, the rent's not going to cover the mortgage payments. It's a funny old world, isn't it? This guy was walking around, swanning around like a new age alchemist, creating money from seemingly nothing. And he thought he'd found the secret source, but it was all only possible because of historically cheap interest rates. He's saying he's got lots of houses. Well, as interest rates go up, he's actually got lots of debt. James. Are we looking at the demise of the TikTok landlord? Quite possible. Sorry, I was just chuckling at the little detail of him having to open his car door to get the light to come back on again. But um, I think in his case, look, this, this, this is kind of, kind of serious what's going on here. Uh, and I'll try and put it in some sort of, just to get a sense of like the scale of landlordism in Britain. We, we all know there's lots of students, right? There's every, well, half of 18-year-olds go to university. 2.3 million students in Britain. There are 2.7 million landlords, right? There are more landlords in Britain than there are students now. And that's mostly this buy to let, where it's someone who owns one house, gets another house. And as he was just describing, the margins on that can be really, really tight. The slightest move in interest rates and suddenly people are squeezed. And they go from having this nice asset that seems to give them money forever with you know, no real effort, financial freedom, as he calls it, right? Uh, to suddenly you're losing money and you're really stuffed. And what should concern us is what happens to politics, what happens to the politics of these people when the world looks like that? Because he's going, it's the Bank of England's fault. That middle interview you played, you know, there's a whole discussion there about the role of the World Economic Forum and the elites who are behind uh, the government and who are steering things. I think all of this can land in a really ugly direction uh, if we're not quite careful about this. This is one of the reasons why I think it's quite important for anybody on the left to have a progressive critique of what's actually going on with the Bank of England, with the financial system, with how the economy is progressing. Let's start to challenge what I strongly suspect is going to be some unpleasant conspiratorial thinking from the radical right around the questions of what's going on with our financial system, what's going on with interest rates, why am I losing out? That's such a fascinating insight. And I think you're right. You know, the, the, the foundation for a successful mass authoritarian project will include people precisely like this, people who have lost out in the aftermath of cheap credit, which is now clearly coming to an end. Remarkable. You know, he's he's almost crying there in his car at the base rate going to 4%. Reminder, the base rate's now 5%, and it's probably going to 7%. So if he's remortgaging other properties going forward, which I suspect he is, he apparently has so many, then the situation is going to be really bad for him. Really, really interesting. Obviously, this is a terrible story for people right across the country, but seeing Samuel Leeds struggle, I mean, I think that would put a smile on almost anyone's face. James Medway, thanks for joining me this evening. Thank you for having me. Pleasure as always. It really was a pleasure. Always almost a lesson with Professor Meadway. And thanks everyone for watching this evening. Come back tomorrow night for another live stream from 6pm. For now, you've been watching Navarra Media. Good night.